been a woodworker for about 50 years now, a uh, professional woodworker. I just turned 70 this, la this uh, last March. Uh, and uh, I started uh, doing woodworking when I was very, very young, six, seven years old. Uh, my brother played the piano at, at seven. I did woodworking. And uh, it's, uh, by the time I was a teenager, I had enough skills that I worked for local builders. I did carpentry jobs, and I put myself through college as a carpenter. Carpentry skills are always in demand. Uh, it's really, carpentry is really the, the basis for most of our structures, uh, even now. Uh, and uh, when I was in, uh, I got drafted. I wasn't a volunteer. You know, I got a greetings, from a greetings letter from the government. And, uh, when they found out that I had been in engineering school before I got drafted, they offered me Officer Kennedy School in the engineering. And I jumped at the chance because I realized that this was a way of uh, avoiding lots of the, the worst things about being in Vietnam at the time. I knew I was going to Vietnam. Uh, this was 1966, and uh, there was a huge call up. Um, people who were 18, 19, 20 were very much aware of this, even though the rest of the country wasn't. It was immediately affected by it. So I got drafted, went to Office of Candidate School, and uh, got sent to Vietnam as an engineering officer. And overall, it was not a bad experience. I wasn't uh, shooting at anybody. I wasn't being shot at. I was there in the thick of it, but I wasn't out looking for it every day. And the plus side was that I was a company commander of a utility construction company. I had a construction company, my own guys. Uh, I had 40 men all kinds of equipment. And I would get orders to go here and build that and go there and build this. This is army construction, it's pretty simple. But they needed somebody who knew about critical paths, about how to organize a construction site, and I, had, I knew this. It wasn't very difficult, and the standards that they held me to were not very difficult. And the best part about it is I was a detached unit, which meant I went here and built there, this and went there and built that. So I was never really around any of my superior <laughs> officers. I was pretty autonomous. So we would get an order to go here and build something, and they'd say, it's gonna take you five weeks, but <coughs> like I said, it's army stuff. It would take us three, and we'd find a place to hang out. And there was always, you know, lots of beer to buy in the Vietnamese market, great pot. So we'd hang around for a few weeks and then go back to the base and uh, get another assignment. Um, <coughs> I got to learn a lot about people. I was radicalized politically by it. Before I went there, I was, uh, I was very naive. I, I felt that the government was honest, telling the truth. Uh, that's not the case. Uh, <coughs> the idea of the end justifies the means was pervasive. It shocked me at first. There was um, no morality in lying to uh, make the case better. Uh, as a matter of fact, it was, uh, <laughs> was supported. Uh, the body counts were always a joke when they were trying to prove how well the war was going. So by the time I got out, I realized that this was a big mistake and that we were the aggressors. Um, it changed my whole view of the government, changed my view of war. The past generation was in a different kind of a war, and that's all I knew. When I was growing up, the big thing on TV was the big picture and victory at sea, which really glamorized this whole thing. <coughs> and it wasn't very glamorous at all. It wasn't glamorous for the soldiers, it was even less glamorous for the civilians. I read, I heard a thing on you know, the VE day, was, uh, just a few days ago, and uh, there was a story about the Russian celebration separate from the Western celebration because of political situations right now. The Russians lost 27 million civilians. That's bigger than many countries. Uh, and it's, it's futile. Feudal and futile, both. Uh, so after I got out of the army, I was very active in the Veterans Against the War. We had credibility, we had moral standing. When I marched in, <coughs> excuse me, when I marched in San Francisco with 750,000 people, which was just mind-boggling in 1972, the front contingent with 3,000 veterans. And in the front of that contingent was about 200 people in wheelchairs. Who's gonna say something about that? And that's when the tide really changed because people saw their nephews, their uncles, uh, their uh, brothers and sisters uh, in, in this war situation without too much justification. 
especially in 1972 when all of a sudden it became public. It was on the news. Uh, during the Tet Offensive in 1969, uh, it dominated the news. And people had no idea that these things were happening there. Everybody just believed what the government was saying. And the government was saying what, what supported its position and with, without any qualms. So um, I don't want to belabor the point. It was, but I, I really learned a lot. I learned a lot about dealing with people. I learned about building things and making things. I had really no expertise in doing this on, a, on this larger scale. But they said, well, you're the officer. You have to learn how to do it. And I looked at manuals. and. Pretty simple stuff, and I did it. And I learned how to get along with people. I learned how to organize the labor forces. Um, and it was a great experience. Uh, I, I was under no hardship, as I said. Uh, and being an officer was great, because you just didn't have to uh, do the same kinds of uh, nasty things that a lot of enlisted men had to do. So uh, uh, overall, it was a maturing experience for me. And when I got out of the Army, I lasted about one year in the cold climates of New England. Moved to California. I have Mediterranean genes in me. And, <laughs> you know, I try to stay out of places where the weather tries to kill you nowadays. <laughs> uh, so I moved to California and um, started building, building homes and remodeling. And uh, the, uh, there was a demand for a kind of uh, organic, uh, handmade things in homes doors, entryways, um, uh, the whole houses, the whole homes could be that. And this was the six. This was the 70s, and people were tired of the 50s and 60s industrial look. It had run its course, and they wanted things that were handmade, which said, they, which people thought was so new. But in reality, that's what people have been using for the past 10,000 years. Uh, before the age of industrialization, everything was handmade, and people cherished things because it was so dear. Uh, they reused them in pieces. Of furniture especially got handed down through generations, especially the pieces that had some character to it. Um, so uh, I, I got in, I applied, I lived, was living in Laguna Beach, and they have a festival down there. I don't know if you're familiar with the Laguna Beach Art Festival. And at the time, it was mostly fine art, painting, sculpture, jewelry. Jewelry is always considered a fine art. I, I don't have to we'll figure that out. Um, I guess jewelry is sculpture, anyway, just small sculpture. Uh, these are house sculptures. So uh, it was an open jury. You had to bring your pieces down. You had to live in Laguna Beach to do this show. It was a local show, but a very high quality show. So I went down there and brought some furniture that I had made, and uh, they were under pressure to expand their view of what art was. Uh, the, that's when the Sawdust Festival started, which is kind of the alternative festival where you could go buy a sand candle. That was pretty nice, actually. <laughs> We've all had those in our homes. And, well, maybe not, not some of you young guys. <laughs> anyway, uh, I got in, and uh, I immediately sold pieces. And people were treating me like an artist rather than as a businessman. So I threw away all my contracting business cards and decided this is what I wanted to do. And uh, I had an initial success that allowed me to uh, continue doing it. Uh, th there's a, it's difficult to make your living as a woodworker. It's doubly difficult to make your living running a small business operation with one or two people. Um, it's just very difficult in, in today's times. People can't, you can't spend six months making a piece of furniture and expect to be able to make a living at it. It doesn't work. So I had to find, I didn't want to cheapen my work and mass produce it, so I tried to find a different venue where people accepted my work as art and sculpture. And uh, the decorative arts has always given short shrift in, in the United States, although that's changing. Um, uh, it just wasn't considered as important as an art form, as, as drawing, painting, literature, which struck me as kind of odd. Um, in other countries, that's not the case. And you can go to any museum and find all kinds of furniture collections where they portray it as art. The, the Museum of Modern Art, art has the finest art, uh, furniture collection in the country. I spent years looking through that place. And the Brooklyn Museum, the third floor of the Brooklyn Museum is all furniture. And it's all furniture with no attribution. 
it's always uh, attribution unknown. So I make sure I sign everything. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, 200 years from now, on the 2216 uh, Antiques Roadshow, somebody's gonna <laughs> pick up a piece of my furniture and turn it upside down. And, and that's great because in a way that's a kind of immortality for me. Uh, we all want to leave a mark and I got a big mark. <laughs> so uh, uh, I've done, I, I, I don't keep track of the numbers, but just extrapolating from the, my yearly production and the, as long as I've been doing it, I've done maybe 5,000 pieces of furniture. And it truly amazes me that I'm able to make a living at it. Um, I really feel blessed because of that. I do what I want to do. I do what I love to do. It's not a chore for me to go to a, the shop and work. I love it. It's my hobby. If it wasn't my business, it wouldn't be my hobby. And uh, I do more than just furniture. I make boats. I make archery bows. That's kind of fun. Um, right now, my current project is um, I'm doing a 30-foot wide mobile in the Calder style, made with wood panels and steel suspension. And it's going to the Cavalry Institute of Theoretical Physics at, at UCSB in their courtyard. And uh, this is a perfect venue. A friend of mine, a collaborator, a friend of mine is a, the artist in residence there. This is a very high level think tank full of Nobel laureates. And, and they saw uh, the mobiles of a, a very elderly uh, member physicist who does these Calder style mobiles, but his are three feet across, two feet across. So they asked me to make one 30 feet, one of his. And they are the structure of the atom. They don't, they have mass, but very little mass compared to the area that they subscribe. And everything moves all the time. And the, the maximum movement, its perimeter, describes the maximum size of the piece of mass, which is exactly the structure of the atom. So when we proposed this to them, they said, yes, immediately. <laughs> and uh, so it panels of wood, they'll be coated with some high-tech um, finishes. And, and they said, this, the rods are steel, steel rods that I'm bending. And, uh, it's not something I usually do, but I like doing different things like this. I like learning new techniques. I use a lot of steel in conjunction with furniture uh, as, a, as a reinforcement. I've even done some pieces of furniture that are all steel. Uh, it's a completely different medium, but if you can make something out of steel, you can make something out of wood, you can make it out of clay or glass. It doesn't make any difference. <clears throat> it's not what the material is, it's who you are. Uh, the skills are very, uh, are very generalized. The biggest thing that stops people from jumping from material to material is fear. Um, I can't do that. I learned a long time ago I can do much more than I really think I can. And to this day, every time I finish a, a really nice piece, I step back and uh, it's, it's just, wow, look what I just did. It surprises me. Um, which is great, because it means I'm always trying to do new things, pushing things. And um, I, I remember reading that uh, some businessmen said the sign to change is when you're on top. So if I have some great pieces and I'm doing well, that's the time for me to start doing new things and expanding. Uh, because what makes my work available, uh, uh, sellable to people, is its difference, its newness, its freshness. Uh, which is ironic because the chair in the window, Italian furniture makers made those in the 16th century. They call them sociable. And uh, what I'm doing is, uh, is, has been done for 5,000 years. In the early 80s, I remember going to the King Tut exhibit when it came through here at the County Museum of Art. And I saw furniture that looked like I made. I was shocked. <laughs> and I figured, well, this is good. I'm in good company here. Uh, and, uh, and then it was as easy to make a curved cut on wood as it was a straight cut. As a matter of fact, it was easier. Nowadays, we have machinery that lends itself to straight line work. So the things we make out of wood are straight lines. But there are very few straight lines in, in, in nature. Now, crystal structures are about the only thing I can think that are truly straight. Um, other than that, everything is round, and biomorphic, and I like that. So I try to make my things look like they grew this way. Uh, I, I think of them as very, um, very natural and not particularly, uh, not filled with much artifice. 
And it's one of the reasons why I think people are attracted to them, because they could be a year old or they could be 500 years old. Nobody really knows. And I like to tell people these are antiques to be. <laughs> um, furniture gets, um, it's cherished. Uh, really nice pieces of furniture last for hundreds and hundreds of years, not because they were really made that well, but because people cherish them and take care of them. Uh, I made a table for some people in 1980, and uh, a woman gave the table to her son to hold, and he left it outside in the weather. It disintegrated. So he asked me to make another one, same table. Because <laughs> his mother was very upset when he did this. So uh, I did. Uh, so then, since the 70s, I've just uh, done basically the same thing, but expanded it. My skills have increased. Uh, although the basic skills I use are not that complex, the biggest skill that I've developed is my eye, which is more important than your hands. I mean, my hands aren't any different than anybody else, except I have fewer fingers. Uh, machinery is meant for wood, it's harder than flesh. <laughs> but it was a good lesson. I learned my lesson without a lot of loss, and uh, I haven't had an accident like that since. It's an occupational hazard, these machines are dangerous. It doesn't take much to uh, be inattentive just for a minute and boom. Um, and over the years, I've uh, developed a clientele of people who uh, ask me to do things and give me more and more leeway. My best work is made on commission, by far. Most of my work is commissions. I do the shows as a marketing tool. Um, well, I should explain to you, I do these art shows and craft shows all over the country. Uh, in San Francisco, uh, uh, this fall I did, uh, or this winter rather, I did the American Craft Council show in Baltimore and then went on to do one in Palm Beach, Florida, and then drove back to California. So I do four, four five, six of those shows a year. I've done the Smithsonian Craft Show, the Philadelphia Museum of Art show. And, um, uh, these are places where I meet people, they see my work. I don't necessarily sell at the show, but years later they'll call back. They like my style, uh, then things change. They buy a new house, they get a divorce. <laughs> I recently made, a, I made one of those stools, uh, one of those um, love seats for a couple. They bought it in Philadelphia, at the Philadelphia Furniture Show, and uh, they got a divorce and she took the bench and he called me one and another one. <laughs> <laughs> so I was a beneficiary of the divorce. <laughs> <laughs> I've established quite a clientele along the way. Uh, uh, most of my clients are repeat clients. Uh, I work directly with people. I work with interior designers. I have a few galleries that sell. Um, the, the market uh, in galleries is very, very difficult because of the markup. I don't begrudge the galleries of the markup at all, but they have to market up to the point where it's very difficult to sell. Um, I don't undersell my work. I would rather not sell rather than sell something really cheap, because it brings my whole price structure down, makes my things look less valuable. Um, perception, in, is like everything else, is really, really important. If people think I'm expensive, fine, I am. Uh, I have what I call the two gas pool for commissions. If I get one gas, it means the price wasn't big enough. <laughs> if I get two gasps, fine. Um, these are, my clients are the same kind of people that buy a, a $90,000 Mercedes-Benz. They could buy a Hyundai, uh, but that's not what they want. And many of these people have, um, to my amazement, I, I run across people who have ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 disposable income a month. And that, that's hard for me to fathom, but they're there. And the kinds of things I make have always been expensive. Um, things that were meant for kings and queens were not cheap. So they, the, the, those kings and queens hired people like me to do it, and our current aristocracy, which is defined by money more than anything else, hired me to do these things. There's always been a demand for it. Um, art on wall is instructive. It can teach you a lot of things, but you can't sit on it. <coughs> art that people can sit on and have a different kind of experience is uh, sometimes amazes people, and uh, it's just great for me. Uh, my my uh, 
family uh, was all, uh, we loved decorative artists, loved artists in my family, a lot of creative people. My father was a mural artist. He came of age during the Depression, which is not a good time to be an artist. <laughs> so he became a sign painter. But signs then were not um, uh, plastic letters spit out by a computer. That someone actually painted them with a brush. And billboards were actually painted by an artist. So he did that for a long time. He did uh, public buildings, churches. He would do Madonnas on ceilings. And later in life, he worked only in the studio, made paintings. And, um, but it was a practical kind of art that was really attractive to me. My uh, grandfathers were both chefs, which is an art, the ultimate art. Um, uh, musicians, uh, lots of my family were musicians, but not professional musicians. They came from a context where being creative and being a musician was great, but that's not the way you made a living. My paternal grandfather was a, a really fine musician on a guitar, but he worked in an American can company operating a machine because that was the way he could feed his family. And uh, making a living at an artist is not an easy thing. There's this long learning curve and an even longer earning curve because to get what you need out of it, is very difficult, and you have to spend a long time learning what to do to get that. Um, there's a joke about making a million dollars as a woodworker. You know how you do it? You start out with two million. <laughs> uh, but I realized it was not going to be an easy way. On the other hand, I had, I had control of my economic destiny. Sometimes I had very little control, and it was what it was. But I learned to get by with very little, and I learned that when things are down, they're always going to go up. Um, when I asked my wife to marry me, we talked about finances, and she asked me how I budgeted, and I laughed. <laughs> There's money I eat. There's not money I don't eat. <laughs> Her first response was, do you want me to marry you? <laughs> but I fooled her. She married me anyway, so. Um, The more I do, the more confident I get, the more, the better my work comes, uh, the more I, I become known. Uh, it makes it easier and easier to make a living at it. Uh, nowadays, I'm usually busy for four or five months in advance. I still don't make a whole lot of money, but I live well. I have a home that my wife and I own in Santa Barbara. So I'm fine. I never really expected to become a millionaire. You know, a thousandaire would be fine for me. Um, I get my security from knowing that uh, I do something that's important to people. It's not something that uh, people are going to forget for a long time. So I have an effect on individuals. I have an effect on people long after I'm gone. I have an effect on lots of people who want to do this for a living. Um, I spend time with People at shows who want to be furniture makers, want to be woodworkers, want to be artists of any kind, and try to encourage them to do what they want to do. It's important. And what we do is important, as much as people think not. Um, without the decorative arts, what, what would we have around us? Um, it used to be that architecture was an art. Now it's a computer skill. Um, well, um, Give me questions. Go ahead. I have a question. Uh, it's about your process, actually. You mentioned <clears throat> um, very early in your talk um, kind of about how each one of these are unique objects or that you create them to almost be perceived that they grew into themselves that way. Yes. Um, and you also suggested that when you first started working, you made a conscious decision not to move into the mass produced. Um, kind of feel, you know, to actually kind of work in the decorative arts, the emphasizing the arts portion as well. Um, so I wonder how much of your work do you find um, is replicating? Do you produce a similar chair, you know, obviously for sets, or do you find sometimes unconsciously that similar languages are coming out as you're producing your chairs? Um, or is each one something, I mean, obviously the wood is unique, the grain is unique, all of these things speak to you, but um, how do you deal with the idea of each one of them as unique sculptural objects and the kind of brand that you've developed, you know, so to speak? 
Van Gogh did about 35 paintings of sunflowers. Mm -hmm. Each one of which is worth about $39 million. <laughs> uh, I went to see Tony Bennett in concert a few weeks ago, a few months ago. And he sang, I left my heart in San Francisco for the millionth time. <laughs> it's not the numbers. Yeah. You know, it's uh, each one of these things. Uh, you know, I realized that when I started making these things that I can't compete with people who mass produce. Uh, not in, in a small shop. You either have to make 13,000 of them or none. So I decided to make something that was in itself an act of virtuosity. These are difficult to do. People have tried to copy these, but they realize that it's so much work to copy. It takes them a lot longer than it takes me. And I have trouble marketing them. They all have even bigger trouble. For two reasons. First of all, it takes them more time, more energy to do. They don't have the same kind of marketing and, and uh, reputation that I do or the same kinds of skills. Uh, and also, people who know about this furniture know what's derivative and know who came up with the first. Uh, a friend of mine, a very well-known Southern California woodworker, Sam Maloof, who died just a couple years ago, I was with him once, and we would, his son was railing about people copying his, his chairs. And his position was that it, the prices on his work never went up as quickly as when everybody started to copy it. <laughs> because people would say, oh, there's a Maloof-like chair. They didn't say, that's a chair by so-and-so. It was a Maloof chair, even though someone else made it. So um, uh, that all these things are like this. Mm -hmm. uh, but also, to answer your question, for, for chairs, each set I do is each one of the set is very, very similar. And I do that for an aesthetic reason, but also for practical reason. Um, the accuracy of the blank has got a lot to do with how easy it is to shape the finished chair. So, and, and the accuracy of the blank has got a lot to do with the shape and, and overall the size and fit of the chair. So I'm very careful to, within each set, keep them the same. But then the next set, I'll modify them. Right. Uh, the chair that, that you're sitting on, is, I did that about 10, 12 years ago, and that's, I, don't, I won't sell that one, because that was really comfortable. <laughs> <laughs> and um, small differences in shares can make a huge difference in comfort. And uh, uh, so I need a standard, so I keep that one around. And then I'll modify them for different people. I, so I've made chairs for people who are very tall or very short, and I modify them one way or the other. So I have patterns in, uh, 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 that I use to cut the basic blanks, and then I'll modify them depending on the people. I've made chairs that are wider for wide people. And, um, it's hard to make chairs fit everyone. You know, chairs are by far, the, by far the most difficult piece of furniture to make. They have to be biomorphically correct for a broad range of people. I mean, we come in such different sizes. Um, they have to be aesthetically pleasing, they have to be capable of being made. They have to be strong. Someone on a chair of this size, if a leg breaks and you fall backwards, you, know, you could die, really. Uh, so uh, they require a lot of engineering. I'm an engineer by education. I'm obviously a mechanical engineer. And I'm still an engineer. I just do it with a, a non-homogeneous material that has a lot of variability in it. And I, I use it to its full extent. And uh, holding them together is a, a feat of engineering. There, I use a lot of high-tech materials. It's not a high-tech project, but I approach it as an engineer when I create these things. I make a lot of the tools that I use. I modify uh, tools, and I use tools that are not intended for woodworking to do this. The tools I do use to shape them are tools that mimic hand action. They just do it with a lot of power so that I can do this quickly and, and easily. Not because doing it quickly is that important. Doing it efficiently gives a fluidity to things that you can't get if it's belabored. If you put too much energy or make things too complex, it shows. The trick, I think, is to make things look simple, fluid, and as I said before, like they grew that way. And I, I'm not, I haven't, didn't invent this. Uh, someone sent me a, a chair, a photo of a chair that, that Gaudi made, just like this one. <laughs> I, I was shocked. I had never seen it before, but 
it was one of these instances of concurrent development. Uh, and it's true with chairs especially so, because chairs are a function of us. Um, I think I mentioned to someone else that there are chairs that are designed to be uncomfortable. The, the uh, captain's chairs you find in inexpensive restaurants. They want five, six sittings a night. They don't want you to sit there and be comfortable and get out. So they make these captain's chairs that come around and hit you right in the kidney. <laughs> so uh, that captain's chair, I can tell it's comfortable. Yeah. I, I love it, it shows when people see my furniture, they look around, they sit in the chair and they just, their whole countenance changes. They just relax, they're comfortable. Uh, that's great. It's yes. interesting your construction because I would have thought, given the shape of the, of the graceful shape, that it would be maybe one piece of wood that, um, but it's it's not. It's in well, there's a good reason for that. Wood is is not linear. You know, in one direction it's much stronger than in the other directions. So uh, if you made this out of one piece of wood, there would be weak spots. Yeah. Where you you can't afford a weak spot. Uh -huh. Uh, so uh, these are this is the basic technique that uh, carousel horses are made with uh, a statuary wooden statuary. If you have a carousel horse with a leg sticking out like that, mm -hmm. and the grain of the wood went along the animal, the grain of the wood at the leg would be going this way; it would break right off. Yeah. So they key a piece of wood with the grain running this way <coughs> to use its greatest strength. And uh, so I picked up on that and, and used that. And, and as I said, it's not a new technique. Um, I think what's made it work for me is that I've developed, uh, I've used different tools, as I said, to, to make it work efficiently and, and, uh, um, and effectively. A big part of this is making them, I can't spend six months making these and expect to make a living out of them. <laughs> as it is, I get a lot of money for these chairs. It seems to me like a lot of money. It's, it, the chair that you're sitting in, this armchair, I, I get $3,500, $3,600 each. I should get more. I mean, it, it's, I still make, I make money at them, but I would love to be able to get a lot more. Um, but if I spent too much time making them, I just couldn't make it viable. Uh, a big part of what I do is I have to recognize the fact that this is my livelihood. Uh, it's not something I just do because I like to do it. Uh, so every time I do these things, uh, I'm reinforced in why I do it and how I do it, and it gives me the wherewithal to keep doing it and do the things. And I, I recognize fully that I've, I have an awful lot to learn, and until the day I die, that's going to be happening. So I always want to do things better, do them differently. Victor, how yes. has your style changed over time, or has it? Has it it has, it has. Um, when I first started doing things that were blockier, uh, they were clumsy compared to what I do now. They weren't as graceful. Um, I'm refining them. I'm not changing them dramatically, because the basic idea, I think, is a viable one. Okay. Uh, I just uh, uh, expand the techniques that I use to make things um, look more fluid, uh, look uh, more beautiful, more delicate. Uh, I like things to look like they're going to walk away. And most furniture is pretty static. It just sits there. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, but, you know, I like people to put a leash on my things. <laughs> yes? Um, I really love the way that this chess set operates within the show in terms of how it talks about soldiers together, about kind of being with another person. Um, and also, I love that about you know, this chair and also some of these these double chairs that you have. Um, and I noticed on your website that you've done several other chess tables. I was wondering if there's something about chess or about sharing um, with these wood objects that kind of that is a drive behind any of, of the work. Well, or... I made a book stand a few years ago. And my assistant was saying, why do you make a book stand? Who, who uses books anymore? <laughs> but that was a reason, a good reason to make it. <laughs> and chess is the same way. Um, chess is the original video game. So uh, I decided to make a couple of chess sets. And uh, I made maybe half a dozen of them. I made them with different kinds of materials, uh, the, the tables themselves, but also the chess sets. 
Uh, I, I just finished two of them. I made the chess sets are made out of uh, large scale nuts and bolts, and I assembled them from uh, different kinds of washers. And the uh, the horses is a big wing nut, giant wing nut. Mm -hmm. And uh, the queen is uh, made out of a connector nut, and the top it has grease nipples all along the top. <laughs> and the king looks like a fire plug. <laughs> Uh, I'm doing another set now that uh, it's just the opposite. Instead of being uh, it's made out of steel, it's made with pieces of bone and crystal. Uh, so it's kind of soft compared to the other one. Uh, I made them mostly to go along with the tables, and, uh, but uh, I like doing the sets. And those, sets are and those are being created to be used as well? Oh, yeah. Uh, so, yeah. yeah. Everything I create is used. Uh, as a, for years, I've been making cutting boards as gifts different kinds of unusual shapes. They look like my furniture. But before I give them to people, I get a knife and I make a mark on it. <laughs> because they won't use it if they don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes? You mentioned Sam Maloof, who was also a veteran. Can you talk more about uh, conversations you might have had? Well, I knew him for quite a while. Um, he always called me the kid. <laughs> uh, we uh, years and years ago in the, in the late seventies, early eighties, he juried a show that I was in in Laguna Beach, and I met him there. And then over the course of the years, I go see him out in uh, uh, Rancho Cucamonga, which always always struck me as a joke name. You know? yeah. <laughs> uh, and he he had a he didn't have so much a stylistic effect on me as. Um, what he did for almost all of the studio furniture makers nowadays, which is basically what people call what I do, is that he gave a legitimacy as art. His style wasn't really that unusual, but uh, it was accepted as, as an art form. And that made it easier for the rest of us. Because I need to, to, make, to make, this, uh, make a living at this, I need to, for people to buy this as art, not as furniture. Because as furniture, there are too many very viable, beautiful alternatives that are quite a bit cheaper. So I have to give it a, an added character that makes it, puts it in a completely different ballpark. Does that answer your question? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And, uh, I loved going to lunch with him. Uh, he, he loved taking people to lunch. This was a big thing with him. And people would show up at his studio all the time. And uh, at, his, um, ceremony, at his memorial ceremony, it was great. It was held at the Claremont Theological Seminary where he did the altar furniture. And um, there was a lot of singing. Um, he was up there in his box. They wanted a plain box, but the boys in the shop made a real elaborate one out of walnut. Uh, and uh, his pastor gave what I would consider a stand-up routine, comic routine, it was hilarious. And, uh, and then after, um, there was a ceremony, after, I mean a reception at his studio and home after that. And like I said, he liked to take people out to lunch. His favorite place was In-N-Out Burger. Mm -hmm. So at the studio, there was a big In-N-Out Burger truck serving <laughs> burgers to everybody. <laughs> he would have loved it. He was very irreverent about it. Um, he, he was very humble about his work. You know, he did great work. And uh, he was recognized as a McCarthy genius. And he was really remarkable at that time when he did it. But he was very self-effacing about it, very humble about it, which uh, Personally, I really appreciate it, and I think is uh, one of the reasons why he was so effective and did so well at this. Big reason he did very well at it was his wife, Frida. She was a master of publicity. Um, she was on everything. She knew who to talk to, uh, uh, what curators were looking for what. So she had. She was his agent basically, and. Um, that's a big part of this. You, know? you have to be a self-promoter to do this. Uh, I do that at shows. You know, I go to shows to entertain people. I set up my booth. I tell jokes. I entertain them. I make them feel like they're in my living room. Because when people buy a piece of my work, they're buying the furniture, but they're also buying a piece of me, a connection with somebody who does something completely different than they do. And uh, the more comfortable I, and the more secure that I am in that, the more people appreciate that. So self-promotion is could be a terrible thing, but it's also what we all have to do to make a living. You know, and a job interview is self-promotion. So I have a job interview with every piece. 
Yes. When you were in the war and, and making the chess set, um, were there other um, people that were making things as well? No, like, not at the time. This was, you know, this was in Vietnam where bases were basically temporary. And uh, the base that I was on for a while when I first got there, Cameron Bay, there was, it used to be a, um, a, a Vietnamese naval base before that, but there was not much there. And all of a sudden it became this huge army uh, supply, supply port, the only deep water port in central Vietnam. And uh, they made it into a major incoming uh, uh, supply depot. And uh, there wasn't much in the way of uh, uh, services for soldiers. So uh, we started building some. Uh, in my job as the, uh, the, uh, the construction uh, officer, I built uh, recreational facilities. There was a lake in the middle of the peninsula, and I built docks, and we got sunfish and sailfish that people would go sailing on there. I built a skate and a trap range, which the Vietnamese thought was the most bizarre thing in the world. <laughs> you shoot a little target, it's going to be blown up all around you. Here we are shooting the targets. Uh, and I did start a small wood shop there uh, for special services. Um, and they did have some other facilities there, but people mostly just drank. <laughs> you know, and that that's, that wasn't just Vietnam. That that's a military thing. Uh, drinking was a, a big part of the military lifestyle. Something that's supported, um, subsidized. You know, drinks in the office of club at twenty five cents, and uh, it was basically free in the enlistment room. Except it was three point two beer, and you couldn't drink enough of it to get drunk. Uh, so they wanted people to be diverted this way, but they didn't want them to get too into the alcohol. The first week I was there, I was invited to a party at an officer's club, and I got really drunk. I woke up the next day. I had no idea where I was. I was all wet. And uh, salt water, I couldn't find my Jeep. And I just decided that was a more drinking. Of course, I started smoking pot then. <laughs> it was much nicer. Uh, I had a, a one of my responsibilities was an oxygen acetylene plant. You had to manufacture this stuff for people. And so it was, a, it was a big tractor trailer, one for oxygen, one for acetylene. And you pull it up to a place, you drop the hose into water supply, and you made this gas. But it was explosive, so it was usually put way out in the middle of no place. And these guys would work one or two days a week, make all that was needed, and then they would just kind of hang out and, and grow pot. It grew really easily in Vietnam. So I go out and check on that a lot. <laughs> but uh, it was a diversion, you know. Nobody wanted to be there, um, and this was something that was um, uh, an escape, but a mild one, and not not anywhere near as debilitating as alcohol. Um, people just I don't, it's a, this is a weird sociological thing. We ignore the effects of alcohol. Alcohol is the single most dangerous drug in the world. The other things pale in comparison to that. I mean, I like a glass of wine now and then with beer, but uh, human beings are, a lot of us are not capable of dealing with that. It's a very destructive habit. Yes? I'm intrigued with the uh, starting point here to get to this chair, and particularly with these sections that are, well, I, I'm not sure that's inside. Well, that's just the blue the, the slot in the bottom is a depth gauge. Okay. I have to dish out the seat, yeah. so I need to know where yeah. it has to be the lowest point. Okay. So you're carving around. Where, and it's this. also an out for the chisel. Mm -hmm. uh, for the seats, I use a, um, a pneumatic hammer and a chisel. Remember, I said before that I use these tools that mimic hand action. Instead of a mallet and chisel, I use a pneumatic hammer and a chisel. Mm -hmm. It's a lot easier on my arm. Um, but it also allows me to focus on where the chisel is going, not how much energy I have to impart behind the chisel to be effective. So it, it frees up a lot of um, the creative insight. Mm -hmm. So I can um, make things and uh, be so tired that I get angry at it. It's mm -hmm. <laughs> so precise because each side has to yes. be exactly I, the, the same right. depth. I am very precise with yeah. things. Do, does, do you do that just by gauging it with your eye and hand? or do you? Are, when you I know? shape them, yes. Mm -hmm. But there are a lot of cues. Uh, I, I draw in reference points when I start. 
These are the same techniques that a sculptor would use. I draw profiles. The, uh, the basic profile is, is done when I make the blank on the bandsaw. And then from there, I'll create other profiles and work to that profile. When, when, any art, when a sculptor does a bust, he looks at profiles. And he makes a profile in one dimension, makes another profile in 90 degrees from that, and then he connects the dots. It's really very workmanlike. It's not as, uh, as uh, fluid as people think. Uh, and the person who draws does the same thing. You pick out salient points that define what a face looks like. And you draw those things in. And then you fill in the rest. So it's not, it's not as uh, freehand as people think. The, when people get real good at these kinds of things, it seems like they're just flying through. <laughs> it's not the case at all. Um, if someone is doing something and it looks effortless, that's good. That means that they've mastered it and that what, what will get done is going to reflect that. Any other questions? So what is your favorite wood? What, what uh, <laughs> that's a good question. Um, you know the moth radio? Yeah. I did a moth thing, and um, but they never put it on the air because it would get it was out that pot. I'm sorry, I'm not a pothead, but you know, these, these come up. Um, years ago, in 1975, I was a much younger man. I went to Hawaii for the first time, and I, I, I was just enthralled by the place. You know, it's just beautiful. And I went to Campbell Burns Wood Products. I had been using a lot of koa. Do you know what koa is? It's, mm -hmm. it's hardwood from Hawaii. I had been using a lot of it in the early 70s. And I, so I went to Hawaii and I went to this mill where they cut koa. And the manager there, I showed him some photos of my work and he was really liked them. He said, well, listen, I'm going up to the, to the koa forest. Do you want to come with me? I said, sure. But I had to wait a few hours. So I, I went out to the mill, and the mill was closed for the day. They closed early. The mill had floorboards with one-inch spaces between the floor. And all the dust from the machinery would fall down through these spaces, and then they'd scoop it up and move it. So I went under the mill and found this big chunk of co coa that they had dumped, because it had some steel rods running through it. I sat down on there, and I reached into my pocket, and I had this joint that German John Wittenberg, this is a very eccentric woodwork on now he gave me. So I smoked it and uh, really enjoyed it. You know, this was the first time in Hawaii, there's the ocean and palm trees, it was just gorgeous. I went up to the forest with the gentleman, and had a great day. And to this day, whenever I cut a piece of koa and smell its pungent smell, I get stoned. <laughs> <laughs> so I told the story at the, at the moth that they audition. They loved the story, but they said they couldn't put it. <laughs> But uh, I, I like all woods. Uh, some woods are more interesting than others. Uh, really figured woods look very nice, but in some ways they detract from the piece for me. Uh, making something out of wood that's not so distinguishable uh, puts more emphasis on the form. Uh, this kind of wood, the one that you're sitting on, the color has got more to do than, this, than the grain of the wood. The black and the red is really Did striking. Can you say that? No. No. No, no, that's a natural color. Uh, I don't use stains at all. Uh, that's The seed is Wangi, and the back is Bubinga. They're both tropical African woods. Uh, and, and even within the same species, like all these mahogany pieces, they're all the same species, but there's a broad variation in color. And it's just like us, you know, we're the same species, but we come in all different colors. And woods the same way. Uh, and the same tree growing in different conditions can have an enormous effect on its color, its grain pattern, its density. Um, so I don't really have a, a specific wood that I'm more partial to. Uh, I, I'm really interested more in the character of the wood and how it relates to whatever I'm going to do today. And so you make stuff in woods within one piece? Sometimes, not all the time. No. I just like this red and black mix. Um, Sometimes it's distracting, but in this particular wood, I don't think it is. It has a more urbane feeling like this, and it's a little more, a little more sophisticated than, than a wood like the mahogany that you're sitting on. A lot depends on what the client likes, what kind of wood they like. 
Well, coal is now endangered, isn't it? Are you no, it's not endangered, it but it's interesting. It's uh, it's not cut very much by consensus, though, not by law. Mm -hmm. The it's a cultural heritage thing in in Hawaii. Koa right. means warrior in Hawaii, mm -hmm. and it was the only tree on the islands large enough to make ocean-going canoes out of. This made it a very valuable material. This was a canoe society. This is the way they did their commerce, where they got their soldiers from island to island. So canoes are very important. And it was uh, until, until 1850, until statehood, it was, uh, or until American uh, takeover, it was taboo for anybody else to, other than royalty or canoe builders to use coal for anything. Um, so uh, in the 70s, the Hawaii Forest Products Association wanted to create a big market for it, and they did. But it came around and bit them on the butt because it got too big. So they couldn't supply it. So in the early 70s, you could get it very easily, it was beautiful stuff. Then they started cutting less and less. And now they realize that it's a cultural asset because it's a symbol of the lost Hawaiian culture for many people there. So they don't cut very much of it. The only wood taken now is uh, fallen trees or trees about to fall. So that limits the supply. But as I said, it's by consensus, not by mandate. Okay, Carol. Uh, that's fine with me. Carol just did a segment with the ukulele yes. maker. And they make their ukuleles. I'm yes. Called, so she'll let you smell. <laughs> <laughs> uh, years ago, I went to the Kamaka Ukulele Works in Honolulu. Really? Yeah. It was a remarkable place. <laughs> The, um, uh, half the people working there are deaf, especially the people who tune the faces. You know, on a, on a string instrument like that, the soundboard, the front of it is what actually vibrates and makes the sound. So you have to tune it. You, you hit it with your hand and you listen to it. And the guys who do that at Kamaka are deaf. But they hit it and they hold it up against the, the back of their head, right? Behind the ear. And they feel the vibrations. And it's also a deafening place, and nobody cares. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that's still the case. But, um, so coal is not used. There are still people who use it for floors and kitchen cabinets, and especially on the islands. Uh, I do a lot of work on the islands, but I never use it for that. I think it's a poor use of it. But for instruments, you know, instruments. Do you remember the red violin? Is everybody seeing the red violin? Instruments get preserved for years and years. They take on a character and a, almost a mysticism that's really, really important to our culture. So uh, I think that's a great use of them. So I don't use koa that much anymore. I can still get it, and I have a lot of it that I hoard. Um, but I decided that, you know, I'm 70 now. What am I hoarding it for? So <laughs> I do a show in Hawaii once a year, and uh, I always make a koa piece for that. And the people there don't quite, not, don't quite know what to make of it because I'm a howly. But I do these things with koa uh -huh. and nobody on, on the island does. So I have the two galleries I show in the islands and they, they pride themselves in having Hawaii artists. So they kind of downplay the fact that I'm not from Hawaii. <laughs> but when I'm there, I tell them that I'm an island boy. I'm from Brooklyn, New York. <laughs> When I'm in Hawaii, I walk around and people ask me directions. I think that's great. <laughs> in, the early, uh, in the early 80s, I got involved in outrigger canoe racing, which is a very popular sport in California. We have 100 teams throughout the state. And uh, since then, I've been building and racing and paddling in uh, outrigger canoes. I was out this morning. So uh, I have this connection with Hawaii. I've been there for races. and. Um, so I'm an honorary Hawaiian. <laughs>